us this morning. Let's sing of the greatness of our God. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Timberline. We serve a God who does great things. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. We're going to get started with our bucket offering this morning. So ushers, wherever you are, you can come up and go ahead. This is not a regular tithe offering. This is a special offering for extreme poverty. So thank you for your generosity and sharing with those around the world. A couple announcements of things that are coming up. This Saturday will be the monthly men's breakfast at Diener's Restaurant. So if you are a man, you're invited at 730. Diener's, just a time for fellowship. Uh, the monthly prayer meeting will be next Monday. Yeah, I can, I'm going to get that date right this time. Next Monday is October the 7th, um, a week from tomorrow. And we'll be gathered here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock in the evening to just pray together as a congregation. I would invite you to prioritize that. We do believe that prayer is important. We believe that prayer is powerful and effective, both for the world at large, but also for us. 
And so I would invite you to prioritize um, the prayer meeting next Monday. Fall Fest then is Saturday, October the 12th. Uh, and that's a big community day for Timberline. So whether you're volunteering or just coming to fellowship, I would really encourage you to put October 12th on the calendar and come out and, and meet the people, fellowship together, play some games, eat some food, enjoy the time. Hopefully, unlike last year, maybe we'll have a beautiful Sunday day and it'll be great. Um, so pray for us as we, it's a wonderful day, uh, a great opportunity to meet new people who maybe aren't familiar with the gospel. And so if nothing else, I'd invite you to be praying for that day as it approaches. Uh, the Young Adults Retreat is coming up October 18 through 20, and the sign-up deadline is next Sunday, October 6. So if there's a young adult in your life, or if you consider yourself a young adult, uh, you can consider that. The sign-up sheet is out in the lobby. Uh, Ladies' Night at the Greenhouse is coming up the end of October. That's o October 25th, and the sign-up date for that is the October 13th. Um, there is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby for that as well. So if you're a woman, you are invited to celebrate at the Greenhouse. Also, just a note for those here at Timberline, so Lindsay is on vacation right now. She left a few days ago, and she will not get back until next Monday, um, so pray for Keith and I. And also, just wanted to make, to, uh, uh, make you aware, the office hours this week will be a little bit different than normal, so maybe call before you show up if you have something, um, and if she's not responding to your emails, that's because she's not in the country, so um, give her some grace for that. Anyways, that's all that we have for announcements. Why don't you stand up, say hello, and we will continue singing. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Hallelujah. 
Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, the Lord, is God, the Lord your God is good. He is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Let's continue to worship him this morning. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are God is 
is holy When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. Thank you, God, that we have found peace and identity in your unwavering love. We are not our own, but we belong to you, Lord. Thank you for holding us in your loving hands. to Christ and we have a purpose in being dedicated to him. Our purpose is highlighted through the unconditional nature of God's love for us. Despite our flaws and our brokenness, his love pursues us and draws us to him. Before I spoke 
I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Lord Jesus, we are so undeserving. And we haven't done nothing to earn your love, Lord. Romans 5, 8 tells us that you show your love for us. And that while we were still sinners, you died for us. Lord, thank you for demonstrating your love. Your willingness to sacrifice for us even while we were undeserving. Jesus, may you be glorified this morning through our worship. Through the words that are spoken, Lord, may you be honored. And may your truth reign in our hearts this morning. We praise you, God, for your goodness and for your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I ask the ushers to come forward for our morning offering. Will you pray with me? Father God, we are not our own. We confess that. We belong to you and to you alone. And Lord, we recognize as well that everything that we own belongs to you. Lord, you are the giver of all good gifts and every blessing that we have has come from you. And we are grateful this morning. And Father, we ask that as a as an act of thanksgiving, as an act of praise, as an act of faith, that you would receive these gifts that we bring and use them for your glory and for your kingdom. And Father, this morning we pray too that as we come to your word, pray that you would grant us soft hearts and open ears, that we would hear and receive the things you have for us, that you would give us wisdom as we continue to talk about some challenging and difficult topics. So Father, guide us now this morning, we pray in your son's name. Amen. Well, it's good to see all of you this morning. My name is Keith. I'm one of the pastors here at Timberline. And I want to welcome you. I want to extend a special welcome to anyone who's visiting with us this morning. We appreciate you and we're glad you're here. This morning, we're going to be continuing in our discussion of a rather confused and difficult subject. This morning marks the halfway point in our series, Created Image. Sex, Gender, and Identity in an Age of Confusion. First week, we looked at the issue of identity. Last week, we talked about the concept of gender. This morning, we're going to be talking about marriage. And so before we go any further this morning, I want to just once again pass on some book recommendations to you, uh, some books that I have found very helpful in preparing for this series and have been very insightful and meaningful a lot of these went out in Capture a Moment this week, but kind of want to point them out anyway. Uh, one of them is Todd Wilson's book, Mere Sexuality. Uh, it's a short book. It's pretty easy to read, but it's got a lot of great content, very, very insightful. There is, once again, a children's book for all of you parents out there. Um, Sam Albury is a, a pastor and teacher who has written a lot on the subject of sex and gender and all those things, and he's written a couple of kids' books. This one is called God's Signpost, How Marriage Points Us to God's Love. It's a great book for younger kids just to kind of help start getting them thinking and understanding some of the things we're going to talk about this morning. And then finally, uh, Timothy Keller's The Meaning of Marriage. This has been uh, just an incredibly helpful book. Uh, in fact, I would say of all the books I'll recommend through this series, if you only pick one to read, this should probably be it. Um, it's just been, um, really had an impact on my life, my marriage. Um, my wife and I have been using it and working through some premarital counseling and just have found it to be tremendously valuable. So I highly recommend um, The Meaning of Marriage. So with that, as we get into things this morning, I'm going to need some help and a little bit of feedback. So I have a question I want to start with, and, and I want to hear some things from you. So the question is very simply, why do people get married? And I'm not necessarily asking why you got married, but in general, as you look at our culture, and as you look at our society, and as you look around at things, if you had to kind of draw some conclusions, what are some of the reasons that people get married? So, I want to hear them. Just call some of them out. 
Oh, wait, that was good, but I couldn't hear it. Say, say it again, one at a time. Security. Good. Someone else, what did they say? It's biblical. <laughs> You're just cutting right to the heart of things, Dave. Thanks. <laughs> Someone else, why else do people in our culture get married? Yeah. Love. Thank you. Companionship. Companionship. The <laughs> Truer words have never been spoken. That's an honest answer. I appreciate it. There's, somebody's got to say it. There's, you don't want to be alone. That's good. There's still another one. Someone be brave. What? Sex. Thank you. I was waiting for someone to say that. These are all different reasons that people get married today. Some are good. Some are bad. But one, none of these things is really the true purpose of marriage. What if the purpose of marriage is something entirely different? See, the concern, I think, is, is that when we don't understand the true purpose of something, or when we use something for a purpose other than which it is intended, it often results in a lot of disappointment and frustration and even anger. And often that anger becomes turned towards the very object that we're misusing. And I think this happens in marriage very often. I thought of kind of a stupid little example of this principle. Um, most of you know that I have a background working in the trades. I'm a licensed plumber, electrician, and so I've spent most of my life working with my hands, working with tools, lots and lots of tools. Despite the hundreds if not thousands of tools that I own, one of the things that over the years, and some of you guys can relate to this, that I found is kind of one of the truisms of life is that oftentimes I'd be out on a job and the tool that I really needed mysteriously disappeared. And now I have to improvise. I remember specifically, um, I, I paid my way through college mostly by wiring up townhomes. My father had a contract. We were doing all the electric in a big townhome development and it fit well into my college schedule, so I would often go out and work on these um, townhomes in between my class schedule, and it worked great because most of the things I needed I could fit in the trunk of my little Toyota Supra, so it worked out well. But unfortunately, not having a fully stocked truck sometimes means I would get out to the job and I'd be missing something kind of important. And I remember multiple times I'd get out to the job and I'd be missing, for some reason, it was often my hammer. Now, as an electrician, a hammer is not necessarily a critical, critical tool, but yet you do still need it. You have staples and things you got to hammer in. And so without a hammer, how do you do that? Well, you improvise. And so I grabbed my, my trusty linesman's pliers, a very heavy set of pliers electricians use, and in a pinch, it makes an okay hammer. So I remember doing entire townhouses where instead of a hammer, I was using this just to pound staple after staple in. And it's still all marked up. You can see where I was beating on it. And it worked, it got the job done, but it was really, really frustrating. And, and after about the 10th or 12th time of smacking my thumb with this thing, by the end of the day, I was so angry, I remember just throwing this across the room out of my frustration. But here's the problem. Was the problem really with the tool? No. There wasn't a thing wrong with the tool. The problem was that I was using it in a way for which it wasn't intended. And I think this describes the state of marriage in our day. People don't understand the true purpose and meaning of marriage, and so they use marriage for something, or they use it in a way for which it wasn't intended. And when the marriage doesn't work out the way they think it's supposed to, their anger gets turned towards marriage, and they decide that that's the problem. Which is maybe why in our culture, marriage is often just the punchline to a joke. You know, if you Google what's the meaning of marriage, you get some really interesting quotes very quickly. Just a couple I found. One was, marriage is like a walk in the park. Jurassic Park. <laughs> they say love is blind and marriage is an institution. Well, I'm not ready for an institution for the blind just yet. Another famous one is, marriage is like a deck of cards. In the beginning, all you need is two hearts and a diamond. By the end, you wish you had a club and a spade. Frank Sinatra contributes this gem. A man doesn't know what happiness is until he's married. By then it's too late. <laughs> this is the ethos of our culture and how it views marriage. And so the question again would ask is, is the problem really with marriage? 
Or it's a problem that we don't understand the purpose and the meaning of marriage. And that misunderstanding brings, breeds frustration and resentment. So this morning we want to talk about what is the true purpose and meaning of marriage. And to do that, once again, we're going to be going back to the beginning of the story. We're going to go back to the book of Genesis. And so once again this morning, we're going to start our study in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read verse 18 and then jump down to verse 21 and read through 25. So we find, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I think the first thing that becomes obvious when we turn to the pages of Scripture and we go back to Genesis, the, the first thing that we would note about marriage is that marriage is God's idea. It's not a human invention or a human creation. It's God who created marriage. It's God who designed marriage. And therefore, it's God who defines the purpose of marriage. You know, when you read through the creation account, the first and only time that God creates something and stands back and looks at it and says, that's not right, is after creating Adam, and Adam looks around at all of the animals, and God sees him there and says, it's not good that Adam is alone. And it's only in the realization that Adam is alone are we indicated, or do we, does God indicate that there's a problem, which I think tells us something rather profound. It tells us that God is not enough. Now that might sound like blasphemy. How could God possibly not be enough? But that's absolutely what the Genesis account shows us. Adam was created and existed in a perfect state of grace. He had a relationship with God that no one else in history has ever experienced or will experience. And yet, in spite of that, God said, it's not good. It's not enough. It's not blasphemy to declare that God is not enough because God himself created us this way. He created us with an intense relational need that is not fulfilled with our vertical relationship with God alone. We need the horizontal relationship with each other as well. Mankind was not designed to live alone. And so God created a helper. And so the second thing we see as we read through this passage is that we need a helper. We are told that God declared that he would make a helper for Adam. A helper fit or suitable for him. And we need to talk about this word helper here for just a second. It's the Hebrew word ezer. And it's unfortunate because I think in English the word helper probably is the best translation, but yet it really kind of misses some things as well. I think part of the problem is that in English, helper really kind of denotes the idea of inferiority uh, or someone lesser than. A helper is someone usually with less skill, less ability, less experience, less value than the one being helped. And unfortunately, at times, some of that same negative stereotype has crept into the way that men and women have related to each other. But when we read through the Genesis account, when we read through the whole Old Testament, we discover that this idea of helper is pointing to man's incompleteness, not woman's inferiority. Because helper really carries the idea of completer. And in that sense, it wasn't just Adam who needed a helper. Eve also needed a helper because separately they were both incomplete. Talked about that a little bit last week. Only together then were they complete. Were they one, and did they fully reflect the image of God? Now, just in case you still think that somehow this term helper is demeaning or is beneath you, just remember as well that as you read through the Old Testament, the same Hebrew word, azer, is used time and time and time again to describe God's relationship to us. Just one quick verse, Psalm 54.4. 
It says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. Same word. God is our helper. I don't think there's anyone here who would say that God is somehow inferior to us in that role as helper. It again points to our need, our incompleteness, our inferiority, if anything. The fact that Adam needed a helper points us to another truth we need to recognize about marriage. That's our second point this morning. It's that holiness, not happiness, is the purpose. I think this strikes at the heart of one of the most pervasive misunderstandings of marriage today. Most of our culture approaches marriage through a personal therapeutic ideal. Marriage is seen as the path to personal fulfillment. Marriage, it is believed, exists to fulfill my personal needs and desires. My happiness is the ultimate goal. And therefore, when marriage stops making me happy, then it's no longer fulfilling its purpose, and it's no longer needed, and it's disposed of. But what if happiness isn't the ultimate goal? Might we once again be looking to marriage to fulfill some purpose in us that it was not actually created to fulfill? Marriage was designed by God to help us become who he designed us to be, his image bearers. Marriage is to make us more and more like God. It's to make us more as he is. It's to transform us into his image, or to put it in a more specific New Testament context, it's to make us like Jesus. I like how Tim Keller puts it. He says, within this Christian view for marriage, here's what it means to fall in love. It is to look at another person and get a glimpse of the person God is creating and to say, I see who God is making you, and it excites me. I want to be part of that. I want to partner with you and God in the journey you are taking to his throne. And when we get there, I will look at your magnificence and say, I always knew you could be like this. I got glimpses of it on earth, but now look at you. So does this mean then that happiness is not part of marriage? That marriage is supposed to be miserable and depressing? Don't anybody say amen? <laughs> no, that's not the point at all. This, this doesn't mean that happiness isn't part of marriage. It's, it means that happiness isn't the goal of marriage. It's the byproduct. See, when we make the byproduct the goal of any activity, we run the risk of really destroying the activity. For example, I love to fly fish. I love it because I love being out in nature. I love being alone on a stream. I love the, the challenge of trying to trick a fish into biting a hook covered with some fur and some feathers. But fly fishing is also a way to get some great exercise. It's a, a lot of hiking. It's a lot of activity. Wading through water and moving water is just a, a, a great workout. But if I ever made exercise the goal of fly fishing, it would destroy fly fishing for me. Because now the focus would, would be on, on how many miles have I walked, how many calories have I burned, not how many fish I've caught, how much enjoyment have I experienced. And in the same way, when we make happiness the goal of marriage, we inevitably risk ruining the marriage. But when holiness is the goal, then happiness becomes the joyous byproduct. Which moves on to our third point this morning. And we're going to leave the Old Testament. We're going to turn to the New Testament for this. We're going to look at one of the foundational passages in the whole Bible that really talks about marriage and the meaning and purpose of marriage. So our third point this morning is that marriage is a mystery. And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 22 through 32. Starting in verse 22, we find it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Mystery, this idea of mystery in Paul's writing, refers to something that previously had been hidden. It wasn't understood, but, but now has been revealed. So Paul says that marriage is a mystery. It's a profound mystery. That its true meaning had been hidden before, but now it's been revealed. So what is it that's been revealed about marriage? Well, marriage is a signpost pointing to Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ and marriage explain one another. When God invented marriage, he already had the saving work of Jesus in mind. This is the great mystery of marriage, Paul says. In fact, it's a profound mystery, he says. In other words, it's a truth so great that its implications are almost unknowable. But how does marriage point us towards the gospel? By reminding us of a fundamental truth about marriage. That marriage is first and foremost a sacrificial covenant. In complete contrast to what many in our culture believe, the Bible teaches us that the essence of marriage, the foundation of marriage, is a sacrificial commitment to the good of the other. This means that love is more fundamentally an action than an emotion. It's a sacred promise that you have made to give everything in you for the good of another person. And this is very different than the popular view of love in our culture. Our culture is obsessed with love. But it's a twisted and shallow form of love, almost unrecognizable by biblical standards. You ever notice that our society talks about love like a disease? Like it's something you catch? Like diphtheria? It just happens to you? Or it talks about falling in love, like love is some kind of catastrophic accident just waiting to happen. But the biblical view of love is very different from this. Because love isn't rooted in a feeling, it's rooted in a promise. And as such, it's a decision of the will. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's something you choose to do, and it's therefore not dependent on your emotions, but on your will. One other Tim Keller quote that I think is just um, powerful in the way it talks about this. It says, in any relationship, there will be frightening spells in which your feelings of love seem to dry up. And when that happens, you must just remember that the essence of marriage is that it is a covenant, a commitment, a promise of future love. So what do you do? You do the acts of love despite your lack of feeling. You may not feel tender, sympathetic, and eager to please, but in your actions, you must be tender, understanding, forgiving, and helpful. And if you do that, as time goes on, you will not only get through the dry spells, but they will become less frequent and deep, and you will become more constant in your feelings. This is what can happen if you decide to love. We move on to our fourth point this morning. Still thinking about what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians. And there's this idea that marriage embraces the other. Biblical marriage needs the otherness of two sexes joining together in one flesh. And last week we talked about how when God created Eve, he created Eve out of a, in our English translations, it usually says a rib from Adam's side. But, but that word rib in the Old Testament, if you really trace it through, you see that it's Always, every other place in the Old Testament is translated the side, almost always referring to the side of a sacred building, like a tabernacle or the temple. And so we talked about the fact that, that man alone is incomplete and, and woman alone is incomplete, that, that separately you only each have one side, and only when you come together to the two sides join together to form the complete image of God. This is why respectfully... I believe that you can call a homosexual partnership whatever you want to call it, but it's not a marriage. 
And I don't say that to be mean or to be inflammatory. I say it because when we take the whole teaching of the Bible, I think it becomes very, very clear that God's design and his intent and his purpose for marriage is one man and one woman coming together in one flesh. Therefore, only in the exclusive, sacred covenant of the joining of one man and one woman is God's true purpose of marriage fulfilled. To put it a little bit differently, if the purpose of marriage was individual happiness or personal fulfillment or sexual fulfillment or financial security or any of the other things that we talk about, then there would be absolutely no reason to say that two homosexual individuals who love each other can't be married. But if marriage is indeed about something else entirely, if it serves a higher purpose than personal happiness and fulfillment, then it may well be that to fulfill that purpose of marriage requires two individuals of the opposite sex. And that is indeed what the Bible would seem to teach. That it is this otherness that makes a marriage. Because in that otherness, in its very nature, it provides a picture and a signpost pointing towards the otherness of the gospel. Because in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus Christ, Jesus is the other. He is the, the God-man, fully God, fully man, come in the flesh to seek and to save the lost, to give his life as a sacrifice for the other, for us, for his bride, for the church. And having done so, one day he will return and he will be united with the church for all of eternity. This is the gospel. And in the marriage of one man and one woman, we see a picture of this sacred and prophetic truth. Now, there's another aspect of this otherness that we need to talk about this morning, which brings us to the 900-pound gorilla in the room. In Ephesians 5, we find here in this passage a very challenging and contentious teaching about marriage. And as much as we would like to ignore it, it's kind of hard because it's right here in black and white. So we can't really talk about marriage, and we can't really read Ephesians 5 and just skip over this. So here we go. Buckle up. We find in this passage two different commands given to husbands and wives. You know, the vast majority of the Bible is written without distinction of gender. The vast majority of Bible, the things that are written are equally true and equally applicable both to men and to women. But there are occasions where God, through his word, does say specific things to men and specific things to women. And, and we can't just ignore those parts. And one of those parts is right here in Ephesians 5. This issue of submission and headship can be a difficult and thorny issue. A lot of damage has been done by the misunderstanding and misapplication of these commands. Let's be honest, a lot of women have been hurt deeply by it. But as much as we would like to just ignore it, I think we need to take the time to understand what God is attempting to say here. So what are these commands? The command, to, for, command for wives to submit to their husbands and husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. What are these commands and what does it really mean for us today? Well, as I was preparing for this message, my wife and I also happened to be going through uh, some premarital coupling, <laughs> premarital coupling, premarital counseling with a couple and this week we were in Ephesians 5, we were working through some of this, some of these questions. And that got me thinking that rather than me as a man just standing up here telling the women of this church what submission means, I thought it might be more helpful to ask my wife to come up and give some of her thoughts on this passage. And as she has come to wrestle through this and what the idea of submission means to her. And so our hope as we talk about this is that no matter where you're coming from on this issue, no matter whether you're coming from a place of embracing this idea of distinct, divinely ordained gender roles, or whether you're coming from a place where that makes you very uncomfortable, it's our hope that you will at least suspend judgment just for a couple of minutes and consider how God may have intended this for our blessing and for our good. So, fine. Um, grab that mic. Am I, am I loud? Good? Yeah? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> it was 
really neat actually getting asked by Keith to come up, especially because we've been so enjoying um, this book and working through um, with this couple and timely, the timeliness of doing this particular chapter with this sermon was pretty neat. <clears throat> so throughout culture and history, um, discussions of the female role of submission within marriage have become contentious and controversial over time. I've almost found in circles, even in Christian circles, they've become almost taboo just because of, of the differences. Um, I remember struggling with my personal role of submission at times in our marriage. I felt like I had the inferior derogatory job compared to Keith. Submission, you know, great. So, for me, I felt like submission was a lot like my kitchen doormat. What does this doormat even do? Now, pretty much nothing. It lays here on the floor, unmoving. It looks pretty. Um, gives some life, some color to my room. Uh, it hides some dirt, right? Uh, it's sometimes, some weeks, it hides more dirt than others, depending on where I'm at in life. You know, this, this particular mat doesn't even serve the function of a comfort kitchen mat. There's, there's no foam, no, no nice magic foam for your feet. There's no comfort cushion to feel good while I step on this and do my dishes. This mat literally, you know, to me, is pretty unfunctional and, and pretty ornamental. <clears throat> and so, especially in marriage, in the beginning of marriage, this to me was a pretty accurate example of how I view submission. And so to help us understand submission as wives, I want to read a few definitions of what submission really means as we move ahead. Webster Dictionary puts it this way. Submission means to readily give in to the command or authority of another, to obey or yield to someone else, and to put your desires lower than someone else. So in my thinking, in some ways, hmm, I think it sounds a lot like this doormat. Sounds pretty, pretty, um, to be honest with you, just kind of confirmed my feelings as a wife. And yet, if I suspend my negativity and my judgment as a woman, this definition sounds like something or someone else as well. I want to read Philippians 2, 1 to 11. In the message, I love this particular version um, of, of this passage. It says, if you have gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Now, mind you, this is talking not just about your husband, but how God wants us to treat each other, period, right? So agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity. He took on the status of a slave and became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. 
He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything. Ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. If we pause and just take that in a minute, all of us, the idea of submission and servanthood, I especially want the women to sit and just breathe that in for one second. Because if we do, this passage about submission and servanthood is nothing like being a doormat. Submission is not passive, it's not demeaning. Our example is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the son who submits to the father's headship with this free, voluntary, joyful eagerness. And it's not out of coercion, it's not out of our inferiority or less than. So as a result, what I have found and grown into and embraced is that submission to our husbands is an active role of dying to who I am and allowing Jesus to show up in all of my words and actions as my husband's helper. Allowing our sacrificial, and I absolutely believe this with all of my heart, allowing our sacrificial submission toward our husbands to be a blazing light in the universe, an example that points to the Lord Jesus, the cross, and the Father like Jesus did. We are to exemplify the gospel of Jesus Christ through our submission. And so our submission to our husbands is not just this mere compliance. It's not being the doormat on the floor. It's an amazing, beautiful, holy calling that asks us to not just be compliant, but leverage every resource that God has given us as women and as the helper to empower our husband. We are meant to be our husband's most trusted friend and counselor, just as he is ours. It's not this mere compliance. It is a give and take within our marriage that we have. It means that we get to hear each other out. It means we get to make our arguments and our opinions known with each other. It allows for hard work, loving contention, sometimes fights and arguments, right? Hopefully we fight well with affection until you sharpen, enrich, and enhance one another. It means that you, as the wife, bring every gift and resource to this life and discussion, and that your husband, as the wise manager, knows when to allow your insight and expertise to trump his own or perhaps shape his own less informed decision. Now, the other piece that I have also found is that submission is not merely this non-compliance or or this, this thing of compliance, but it's not a blind, unconditional obedience either. The Bible doesn't even teach that with one another. No one should give another human being unconditional obedience. It says in Acts 5.29 that we must obey God rather than man. So this means that a wife is not called just to submit to her husband unconditionally. We should never aid our husbands or anyone in doing anything that God forbids or which is destructive or abusive. It's never kind or loving for us to enable any sort of behavior that is sinful or less than what God has created us to be. And so that is part of our role in loving our husband and submitting. Most 
important, and this this just um, honestly jazzes me, and, and this is the part of marriage that just I can't get over that we get to be part of, um, and that is that it means I get to imitate the role of Jesus Christ, not only in my marriage, but I get to imitate this role so that a world who absolutely needs the gospel of Jesus Christ and his salvation gets to watch it within this relationship with my husband. And so what I have found is that when I embrace my created and assigned role of helper and submission, I discover that I have a great gift for getting in touch with the deepest self that God has created me to be and designed me to be. I also have found that we get to experience the mysterious beauty of the gospel being reflected and mirrored through our marriage. Being a helper means my role isn't just to help or complete him, but as Keith referenced earlier, to complete us. Being a helper means I am putting two sides back together so that together our marriage can reflect and imitate the love of Jesus Christ and our Father. In this role of submission, I am not the doormat any longer. I am called to imitate the love of Jesus Christ. You, ladies, are called to imitate the love of Jesus Christ. How could this ever be a bad thing? Thank you, hon. Appreciate all you had to say, but now, guys, it's our turn. Because, <laughs> men, we don't get a pass on this issue, and I think there's some things that we need to clearly understand, and I want to hit them very quickly as we, we um, move towards a conclusion here. Some things that I think guys, men, we need to understand about this idea of headship and submission, and the first is that headship is sacrificial service. The husband's authority, just like Jesus' authority, is never used to please himself, but only to serve the welfare of his wife. So men, headship doesn't mean that you get to make all the decisions. It doesn't mean that you're large and in charge and the king of your castle. It doesn't mean that you get your way. In fact, it's quite literally the opposite. Our exercise of headship and authority is to be modeled after Jesus. And we're told in Romans 15 that Jesus never did anything to please himself. So if you're using some twisted idea of headship to please yourself to make sure you get what you want, well, brother, that's a sin. And you need to repent and change your ways. Because headship, as Ephesians describes it, is a high and holy calling. It means that you sacrifice your wants and your needs for the sake of the welfare and sanctification of your wife and family. Headship means that your wife's needs will always supersede your own. Because we are called to love our wives as Christ loves the church. And unless you forget, Jesus died for the church. That's the depth that our love should imit imitate. Second thing we need to remember is that headship loves and serves. It does not dominate and demand. Man, we need to stay in our lane on this issue. We need to worry about the command that we are given. We're commanded to love our wives with a sacrificial, self-giving love. What you're not commanded to do is to make sure that your wife submits to you. Her submission is between her and God. It's not yours to enforce. You focus on what you're called to do. Love your wife as Jesus has loved us, unconditionally and sacrificially. And then finally, the third thing I would say is that headship is a burden, not a crown. I hope it's clear by now that despite the name, headship isn't something that elevates men over women. In fact, it's the opposite. Headship doesn't stand up, it kneels down. It's something that humbles, not something that elevates. I believe at a practical level, then, the calling of headship means that the buck does stop with you, men. What I mean by that is not that you make all the decisions. What I mean by that is that I believe that God lays on the husband the ultimate responsibility for the condition of his marriage and his family. You will be the one to give the final account. 
And so the question is simply, how are you doing? How well are you loving and how well are you serving your wives? My hope this morning as we wrap things up would, that be, would be that we have a, a clearer understanding of the purpose and meaning of marriage and that we would recognize that just like our identity, it's not formed from within ourselves. It's something we receive from outside of ourselves. It's given to us by God. So marriage is a signpost. It's meant to point us towards some greater ultimate truth, and it's meant to point us towards Jesus. Which means there's one last thing that I think we need to know and understand about marriage, something rather profound, and this is the last point, is that marriage is meant to disappoint us. Now that might sound like a really negative thought to end a message on marriage, but I don't think it is. In fact, I think it points to something absolutely great and glorious. Marriage at its very best can be an incredible gift. It can be a great joy. It can be a wonderful, wonderful thing. But even at its very best, it's still not the ultimate goal and the ultimate destination. It still just points us towards something greater. And we shortchange ourselves and we think that marriage is the greatest good that we will ever experience in this life. That there's no higher goal or higher purpose than a happy, well-adjusted marriage. And that the end-all, be-all of all human experience is marriage, because it's just not. Marriage is a little like a couple who saved their entire lives for the vacation of a lifetime. A month in the tropical paradise of Tahiti. And for years and years and years, they scrimp and save and put away every penny looking forward to the day when they'll finally be able to afford to take this trip. And, and finally, in, in their golden years, in their retirement years, they have the resources and they buy the tickets. And so the day finally comes where they pack their bags and they head to the airport. They make their way to the ticket counter and they get through security and they wander through the airport and they finally see the gate that says Tahiti. And with excitement, they go and they find a seat and start unpacking their bags. And they sit there for a while in silence. So finally the wife looks at the husband and says, you know, I'll be honest. I thought Tahiti was going to be a lot warmer than this. <laughs> the husband looks back and says, you know, I actually thought there were going to be a lot more beaches and pools as well. The wife finally after a while responds, you know, I'm actually kind of disappointed. I'm not sure what all the fuss was about. We should have just stayed home. You know, marriage is a beautiful and wonderful mystery, but we can't forget that it's not the ultimate goal. It's just a signpost along the way. It's a boarding gate pointing us towards something much, much greater and far more glorious. And if we get confused and we think that this is our final purpose, our highest ideal, we will be greatly disappointed. But if we recognize that there is something greater, then those disappointments we experience in marriage will just serve as reminders of something better yet to come. And on the other hand, the joy and the happiness we experience in marriage will just be an appetizer, enticing us to dream of the glory that God has in store for us. I want to close this morning with one last quote from Tim Keller. It says, The hard times of marriage drives us to experience more of this transforming love of God. But a good marriage will also be a place where we experience more of this kind of transforming love at a human level. This is the great mystery. Through the gospel, we get both the power and the pattern for the journey of marriage. Will you stand with me as we close in a benediction? First John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Go in peace. You are dismissed.